he got hit here and it was like he had a big cut here and his eyes ball were out and it's just hanging. How do you help someone in that kind of situation? I had no choice. He was almost dead, but he was still moving his like legs and hands. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you want to watch this episode completely uncensored with no ads, click the join button down below to become a member. Members are going to be getting a lot more than that very soon. Anyway. Hello, Mingmaji. Hey. Hello, Augie. How are you? How would you describe what you survived? It was in 2015, April 25th. I was actually leading a big team on Everest. Mm -hmm. I had like almost like 24 or 25 clients. Everything got collapsed. And it was like huge snow, like it fall at, at, at a time, falling from like uh, 6,500 meters all the way down to 5,000 meters. It was like very powerful when, when you hit, hit the ground and it, it started blowing up. It was like very powerful. 18 people died, six from my team. <sighs> yeah. Then one was my relatives, like a brother-in-law. It was an avalanche which came after the earthquake. 9,000 people were killed in Nepal. Mm. So it, it was just not just in the Everest Space Camp, but it was all over Nepal. In the beginning, we thought like it was very safe because we were in the like middle of the base camp and yeah. it, was, it was like open, like empty, open place. And we were not like uh, under the big buildings after like um, three to five minutes. So we just heard a, heard a uh, sound like boom. At once, and, and there was like a snow rolling, rolling, just rolling. How much time did you have to react after seeing it? Maybe less than like two minutes. What was going on in your mind when you had that, within that two minute span? I was a bit, bit lucky because I was a bit away, away from, the, from the center point. You was, were just on the edge yeah, of it? I, I, was, I was almost on the edge. When I ran back to my camp, I found nothing. So my client from Netherlands, he was actually he was a cameraman at, on, on the team. So I just saw him like uh, with his hanging skin on his fish. Yeah. So you, the avalanche settled. Yeah, the avalanche, yeah, the avalanche uh, came down and, and maybe it blow the rock. And I think he he got hit with the rock and it it got away his, his skin and it was like hanging. Just just a skin it, 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 flap. It's like a, like you you know the goat hanging with the, with the uh, like ears. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was something like that. The skin was hanging over there. Whoa. And, and, and it, his face was like full of blood. And it was so difficult to recognize, and he, he was just, just like staying without like with he was like under responsive, like he was just hang, staying like this. Then as we started searching like more and more friends, more and more friends, then we saw the first first body that was one of my brother-in-law. We were in Montecito, living in Montecito, and a series of fires had raged across the mountain range there, followed by some torrential rainpour, which caused a big slurry of mud to come down the hill and wipe out large chunks of Montecito. At the time, they had broken it into two distinct groups, uh, the, the officials. They had voluntary evacuation and involuntary evacuation. They knew some rain was coming in. They thought it would be a lot. They wanted to be careful of flooding. They were mostly thinking about flooding. And so we were in an area called voluntary evacuation. They had had three involuntary evacuations prior to this one, and all having to do with the fires. So the fires mm -hmm. were raging across, and when involuntary evacuations, you collect your animals and your precious belongings, and you stick them in the back of your car, and you leave the area along with the thousands of other people that are leaving the area and try to find a hotel or a mm. place to sit for a day or two. It disrupts your entire life. This was the third or fourth one, and it was it was voluntary at this point. Mm. My family, my kid, my, my wife and daughter wanted to leave. Yeah, I was like, hell no. You You're know, like, I, you already did this twice? I've done this, you know, and uh, as sad as it sounds, it was the NCAA National Football Championship. Alabama was playing. <laughs> And it was happening about that night, and I wanted. But to I'm see, not going to miss my I football see game. A football game. I'm going to sit there, and, yeah. and they are begging to to leave. And you know, and I I was like, if it's voluntary, we'll get some warning. It wasn't raining very hard. Mm. There was no problem before. It was a it was a rain instead of fire, you know. And so mm. I said, yeah, if you guys want to go to a hotel, absolutely. If there's a problem, I'll gather everything, put it in the car, and leave and meet you at the hotel. If there's mm. a problem later tonight, I'm staying. And so I went back to the football game. My lovely daughter, she's younger at the time, she got her pet rabbit and put it in a box and put it on the oh. on the uh, on the kitchen counter and said, Dad, you know, if you make sure you get my rabbit. And we had a dog. And I said, I'll get the rabbit, I'll get the dog, I'll get in the car, I'll leave. Mm -hmm. you know? That was it. At about four in the morning, 
I woke up. It was quiet. Mm. And uh, it was just something felt weird. So I went outside and was looking at the drains. They looked clear. And then I saw up on the hill, up on this mountain to the right, this big orange glow. And I could just see these trees slapping down, just going bam, 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 way up. And then I could hear this low grade, like jet engine rumble, like a locomotive rumble. And I, I, cu I couldn't figure out what I was looking at. It was just such a bizarre thing to see in the way out there. And then as it got closer, I saw that it was a huge wall of just everything, trees and rocks and cars, and it's just rolling right, you know, eight feet higher than I am, straight at me. And I was like, oh, and I ran. I thought I had enough time to get the dog, get in the car, which was behind the house, and drive away. I didn't have a minute. I had maybe 30 seconds. The dog was right there. I grabbed the dog by the collar. I reached for the bunny, but I missed him. I got, you know, towards the back of the house, and then the whole whole slide hit me and caved in. I'm a huge tree, speared right through one side. And these boulders, you know, you would think a boulder wouldn't move, but these are, you know, 20,000 pound boulders. They're size of a pickup truck and whatever they touch just goes away and they just started punching through the mud came up and I'm struggling and pinned up against the against the fireplace and the dog was under the mud and did you think that you were dead I thought I mean I, it was so so powerful I mean I, I don't it was just unbelievable and that mountain is about 3,000 foot elevation so ah. it's a massive amount of rain that just picked up all the mud and picked up all the rock there was nothing to stop it, and it just c continued to build and build. And by the time it hit the base where our house was, it was unstoppable. I found out later our, our room was the first thing just sheared off. If I had been asleep, it was it was gone within seconds. They just went right through, took out the room, took out the garage, took out the cars, just everything swept to the ocean. But then what happened was that the uh, some big boulder or tree punched through all the way through the house, and all the mud went that way. The pressure got out, and I could get over to uh I, it might i didn't realize I still had the dog in my car it came up out of the mud and still alive and um we i got through fought my way into a low pressure zone and there the mud was maybe two feet okay um we had two cats too and they were in there i could see and they were bouncing around in the mud trying to i thought you know but i still had the dog and i dragged them up on this landing that we had going upstairs and uh and the mud was filling that room though mm. and uh we had a window, so I kicked it out on the way up, going up the thing, and then the mud went cascading out the house. And then I got up to the next floor, and I thought, you know, it's still here, and part of the house is still up. And I look up, and there's my daughter and my wife. They had not gone to the thing. You thought they were gone? I thought they time. were gone, and they were there. And then also my son had come in from college, and he was there. He had come in late that night, so he, one of my two, one of my three sons was there too. And then I'm just looking at them and they're looking at me and we're like, I, I could not believe that. I said, well, get on, you know, I've seen, you know, some movies where you get on the roof. Like, let's get on the roof and let's get to the most stable thing. And we built this beautiful stone fireplace. So we I threw everyone up on the roof and then we just held on to the, the fireplace mm -hmm. thing. And that was big and, and wide. And then mud had now come on either side of the house and was chipping away the house underneath for about 15 minutes there it, it was the it was just uh unbelievable flow i mean you, i saw things coming down you know whole chunks of concrete abutment you know huge propane tanks um and what it what had happened it turned out that glow up on the hill that i really seen is one of the uh big gas mains had sheared off and it had exploded, blew up a house, uh, and, and it was shooting fire, and that was the glow that you saw. And we had one of those gas mains too, and about when we were up there, it sheared off. And all of a sudden, there's just this um, just this jet engine of gas, propane, shooting up out of the mud right by our house, and it was just thick with propane in the air. And I thought we were gonna have just an explosion. I thought it was just gonna, you know, we are gonna blow up there, and it was that moment that you know, I was, I, I looked to my daughter and said, I'm so sorry if this goes the wrong way. I'm, you know, I'm sorry that you're in this position because I, I felt like I killed my family. What are you thinking? Are you like, I got to rescue people? I was 
very nervous, but I had to think a little bit, right? Because because I was I was the I was the head of the team, so I had to I had to think I had to manage everything because most most of the uh, most of my staffs they were very scared. Try to convince like um, my team team like the, all my Sherpa team like okay we need we need to we need to like help everyone to get to get in safe place first. All the like those other clients who were like safe they they came together and we started like finding more and more. It was like very difficult situations where I could read, barely remember all my team members. So I said, mm-hmm. okay, okay, uh, like you, you find your partner, you find your partner. Then we started finding more people. So we we found like all the alive one and six, six, six dead. There was a team just next to, next to our and most of their team members, they were in, they were in a higher camp, not, not in the best camp. And we found like the, uh, two members from their their team, they were also dead. There there were like lots of lots of other climbers from different teams who were on the top of the base on top of the base camp. Which base camp was a bit mm-hmm. safe, so they, they came down, help help uh, us a lot to carry our injured people to safer place. You mentioned in your documentary one one of the people that was really shocking for me to hear was where like some of the poles from the tent had. Yeah, that that's a, that that was my Chinese brother. He was sleeping, so he was naked. He just had a jacket, and then it looks like he was hit by a pole. The pole was blown, and he got hit here. And it was like he had a big cut here, and his eyes ball were out, and it's just hanging. His eye was hanging. Yeah. How do you help someone in that kind of situation? I had no choice. He was almost dead, but he was still moving his like legs and hands. But like nothing but going he, on in he, his head. Yeah, like he could not speak anything, but he was just moving his hand and legs. So I just saw his eyes, eyes out. It was like a bit difficult. I just put it, put it inside, and just put his cap down. I didn't and know you yeah, could do that. Yeah, I, I had to, I had to leave him die there, because it was not possible for us to save him. If he was alone, he was the only, only, only person who got, uh, who got injured or he, who got hit by avalanche. Then maybe there was a way to save him, but. The whole the base camp was hit by avalanche, and there were like hundreds of people who got who got injured there. So you had to start prioritizing yeah. who was savable. Yeah, yeah. It, it 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 was the best best idea because With, those who those who are who has died, we better not to take care of those, right? Because, because the, we, instead we could save more lives, right? The Chinese guy was guy was so close to me, so I had to. It was so difficult to leave him. Just like um, struggling to die, I spent almost like half to half, half to forty minutes staying with him to, to 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 calm down. Like I was just waiting for him to to stop, like to die. Did you just have to support him and and, and yeah, show? I tried. I took a catch a little bit and just tried to rub. I could do, I could do that only on the day. Yeah, it was it was horrible. After about 15 minutes, that area, we didn't go anywhere. We were mm-hmm. still, and then the pressure on the mud started to go down. I got down there and it was about neck high, but I could manage it. It wasn't taking me downstream. I waited about 10 more minutes and then it got down to about my chest and mm-hmm. it stayed there. And I got my family off the roof, held hands and walked our way in up to where it was a safer area. And I went up to the uh, firemen who had, who had prepositioned and I told them, you know, we were alive and we're here, and they, they got their boots on and started coming down the road. I was just worried about this one single mom and her two kids, which I couldn't find. And uh, so he strapped up with a couple of his guys and he came down with me back through the mud. We looked around and at about that time, of one a debris pile, there was a little noise coming out of, and you could see a little arm you know, moving. And the fire captain got every fireman you know, that we could find and everyone was just ripping at the pile and um, got down to the bottom of it. And it was a little, I, it was just a little muddy baby and, um, and alive. And you can think about that, that, I mean, how it could, I don't know how it survived. It was just a little baby, couldn't swim, couldn't do anything. It had been torn out of its house a half a mile upstream, been in that huge mass of concrete and rebar and everything, hit our house, smashed in, been piled up with pile all over it and then survived for at least an hour, hour and a half. Whew. And a baby survived. And, wow. And uh, lost his, his mom and his, his family, but he survived. Wow. And, um, 
and so, and I'm still friends with the, mm. the, the baby to this day. And we, we uh, uh, did some fundraising for him and mm. um, he's a great kid. I lost good friends in the mud and uh, one of my best friends and his daughter and uh, they were in an involuntary, evac part of an involuntary evacuation zone. And, um, but he decided to stay too and, and lost his life and his daughter. So there's some, I mean, it was, it was truly tragic. There were 17 lives lost yeah. But for some reason, you know, like, how does that make you feel knowing yeah. that for some reason you're okay and your family's okay? Yeah, I, um, I wasn't a spiritual person. You know, I'm not particularly spiritual, you know, that type of thing. But um, we, had, uh, we had lost uh, our oldest son to a training accident a few years before mm -hmm. um, at UCSB you know, here in town. And um, he was a great guy. And, you know, he, my wife and uh, daughter decided to stay in his room you know his room survived you know and it was one of the room the room that saved them was was his room and uh, you know it's it just felt like everything was in some way you know guided i don't understand how we all survived the last last person in the team was a japanese guy could see him nowhere and we found him other side of the camp mm -hmm. i think he also started running and maybe hit somewhere and he broke his both legs and his, his like hand was twisted a bit more like this mm. and he, he, he was lying on his hand mm. so both legs were damaged like broken is uh, this hand was totally like uh, twisted broken and this uh, i think he got uh, broken somewhere else so it was difficult and he he was just under under the snow, and he was just moving mo moving with with this with this one, one hand a little bit, and his face was moving something like that. I just had to grab him on his back and pull him out of the snow and drag him uh, drag him on the safe safer place. Did he survive? No, he died in Kathmandu, so he was okay. All the night we 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 helped him. And he started talking a little bit. He could remember a little bit. He was hospitalized, just reached the hospital. And there was another aftershock. And everyone started running. And maybe it looks like he got heart attack. Because, he, yeah. From the fear? Yeah, from the fear. You finally have everyone accounted for. Yeah. But you don't feel safe. And, and mm. there's so many injured people. You've witnessed so many yeah, people so many. dying. Mm. What do you do with the, the people there while you're waiting for rescue? In, 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 like, you know, in a tent, we, we, like, lots of people sleeping together. Mm -hmm. mm. We, we spent a horrible night that day. So how many days until you were finally rescued? One, one night. Did you have any moment to sit with your emotions or your thoughts in that time? Most like uh, around six, seven o'clock in the, in the evening when everyone got rescued. Then we got a little bit time to hang on the internet because mm. we also need to inform inform the inform the family. And then I realized that there was earthquake. This EP center was in my in my hometown, not in every space camp. You thought that it must have been in base yeah, camp. Yeah, we thought it was in a base camp, but it was in my hometown. We were expecting like a helicopter early in the morning at nine o'clock. Finally, there was like a small window opening so the heli helicopter entered the every space camp and it's and it started rescuing so there were <clears throat> like 12 out of dead bodies at base camp so we just wrapped wrapped them in a in a like a torn tin or la on, on a in a plastic bag so we just we just had to like throw like this so how does that sit with you mm -hmm. having that uh, treating dead bodies like they're just a, a log that was a horrible experience in my life First time I had like so many dead bodies in front of me on the mountain, just and also it was like just throw, throwing. Yeah. On the first day, like when we found most of the dead bodies, it, they were like warm, and on the second day, everything was cold. So they're more stiff and didn't yeah, really feel right, like a yeah, person mm, as much. Right. Mm. Two dead bodies we found the next day only, so they were all little frozen and hand was something like like this, so we had to grab it and put it back. It was like uh, breaking the hands. Oh. And, because we, we could not put it, put it in the helicopter or something like this. And uh -huh. there's like more. We, we didn't have like that much that much sense to to think too much. We lost all our mind. Mm. We're just, just working whatever like we felt. 
like on autopilot. Yeah, auto, 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 yeah. So I think we just were doing 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 anything like on the spot, but there was not like like thinking long or thinking too many things. Do you feel like you've processed it now? Do you feel like you're okay with all that stuff now? Or is there ever a point where you can feel okay? I feel okay now, but now like if something happens on the mountain, I have now very calm nature. Really? Yeah, I, I can easily handle. Like like this year, uh, just in 2022, we had another avalanche on a mountain called Manasolo. Six of my Sherpa, they were climbing up and it was they were taken down by, by avalanche. Two of them were very critical. One broke his leg, one got hit on his, his head and his face were all swollen. And my like uh, some of my, my guides, they were like so scared. And I said like, don't worry, be calm. Just speak slowly. What's what's going on there? I had few cases. Now I feel like so calm. So when, whatever happens on the mountain, I can easily handle now. You're able to talk about it in a way where it doesn't feel like you're, like it's just tearing you up at all times. For a like few days, it was so difficult. Uh, like I, I had that incident like coming in my mind frequently. Just keep popping up. Yeah, keep, keep popping, uh, yeah, keep popping. But now, I think because I I have. To, this is stories in many places now, so I feel a bit comfortable. But when I, but when I speak these things, I still like my head. It gets like kind of like a bit headache. You get a headache. It's, it's like a bit bit pain. Mm. Yeah, it's like something here, like just this part, just just like just the memories. Yeah, just thinking right. about the memories right, yeah. is painful. Because when I talk these things, I I just remember him like is struggling to die. And those are the types of images that just don't leave your mind. They sit yeah. with you. Yeah. Right. I think that that made me, that made me a bit stronger. Now, like I see, like people dying. I was like, I, I, I find myself like it's part of life. And I can't go without thanking BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has helped reframe my view of the world by allowing me to feel empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I am today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with motivation or feelings of depression anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed and provides customized therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't even have to see anyone or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're entirely comfortable with. One of the hardest parts about getting into therapy is finding that therapist that you actually connect with and the price of going through multiple therapists can start to add up, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. So huge thank you to BetterHelp for giving us spent a day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. And I can't go without thanking Dipsy for sponsoring this episode. Dipsy, of course, is an app full of short audio stories designed by women, for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, and content is released every single week. So in between listening to your favorite stories, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and now they also offer written stories. So no matter how you like to consume these delectable little morsels, you're set. Before I spend today with viewers and listeners of the podcast, Dipsy's offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Padilla. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash P-A-D-I-L-L-A. Again, and I'm only going to say this once more, tipsystories.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of natural disaster survivors. Did any of that reframe the way that you think about your life? Yeah, money used to mean something to me. Mm. It doesn't mean very much to me anymore. What matters more to you now? Time with family, 100%. Mm. You know, Really, what I learned from that is that all your things, all the things I saved are inconsequent. They really don't matter. I had a baseball card, a Mickey Mantle baseball card. Mm -hmm. I had that thing, that thing was my, I have it, you know, mm -hmm. and gone, you know, and I'm the same person I was with or without. Yeah. You know, like, things are immaterial. Things are immaterial. And that, that's kind of given me the, the feeling I can be or do anything I want. I feel like a lot of people would live their life differently if they had the confidence in it, if they lost the thing if they, if they risked something and it went away or failed that it would be okay life would be okay yeah. that they would try a lot more things yeah they would try and you can always rebuild you can always rebuild it, it you know you just if you could do it once you can do it again that's what i learned mm. and what was crazy is when we came back a day they we, we 
they closed off the whole area because they didn't want looters or anything. Yeah. But we got in and we came in and through mud that was, you know, still three feet high. Our house sitting there on the stump was the rabbit in its cage. And it had been buried in the cage in the mud, but just its head was under it. And then some firemen found it and got the mud off of it and it survived. And oh. it was in the cage sitting there as we walked up to the thing. And our dog survived. And three or four weeks later, we came back again. They let, they, and then they closed everything off. And, they were, and three or four, they let us in. And we'd go up to where my son's room, Nick's room was still a lot, still there. And we opened the door and our cats had been sleeping on his bed. They, they survived in that mud thing too. Everyone survived. Cats, that is insane. Rabbit. It was crazy. Do you ever feel any survivor's guilt or anything? No, I I really miss my my uh, my good friend. He uh, and his daughter. He was a, a hand surgeon, and everyone knew him in town. Great family. They grew up with my family, known each other forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to, for 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 them to 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 lose both of them mm. was you know it just it, un, it was preventable, and mm -hmm. and I I feel. You know, I, I miss them every day. And I don't feel survivor's guilt, though. I don't feel that at all. I, I mean, I, I think I'm sad for those people that are missing. But I'm so, so happy for everyone else that survived. Mm -hmm. Many people were rescued. People survived. I, I would rather celebrate those that mm -hmm. survived. And How do you feel about life and death now? Has it changed the way that you think about when you'll live, when you'll die? So, like, if there's time you die, you will die. We have lots of stories where our friends die just in the bathroom, just taking a shower and right. fall down, hit, hit, the, hit, 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 hit somewhere and died. If your destiny is to live 100 years, you do whatever, you, you'll, you'll, you'll stay alive. If your destiny is just like 40 years, 30 years, you're going to die anyway. So just going on the stairs, you may fall down, just like while driving, you, you just hit somewhere. Mm. It's just, I think it's just a destiny. So. So you're not afraid that you're going to put yourself in situations where you'll die because you yeah, feel I like think, you'll die either way at some point in your life, regardless of what you're doing. Yeah, because I've I've, I've tried so many hard routes on the different mountains. I'm, I'm I'm a bit scared sometimes. Like I might get like frostbite or I might fall down and break my hands or legs and I, I, I get like paralyzed. But with the life, I don't get fear because if there is destiny, you, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. How do you find? solace in that, that that mindset so my father he got a first bite in 1983 where when i was not born so he had to cut his eight fingers he lost eight fingers yeah he lost eight fingers climbing with the japanese team which fingers did he have left he just got like two thumbs just two thumbs yeah the thumbs are very important to put <laughs> fingerprints <laughs> yeah fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> so he can still do his fingerprints yeah. and do thumbs and he, up yeah he got like a half so we got like one two three right yeah, so you mean the knuckle? You just got only one. Oh, uh, so we had yeah, one we of had these. Like more joint. than half. My mother saw, 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 saw those things from, from their like young age. They, they just got married maybe after like three, four years. My father, father got like this frostbite and they struggled all, this, all their life. And even like uh, because of them, we also struggled from, from our childhood. My mother, she never wanted me to climb because she saw her husband. She saw what happened yeah, to your yeah, father. Yeah, what happened to my father. But for me, it was like an um, interest because uh, my uncle they used to be a guide. My father used to be a guide. Mm -hmm. So I used to have lots of stories from them when I was like a child. And after I finished my schooling, uh, I wanted to have a kind of experience their life. So I just joined expeditions. After that, I got, I got like a kind of like addictions. You were addicted to climbing? Yeah. Mm. Actually, I, I just wanted to see how how their life was how, how they they spend their life because we used to hear lots of stories of this climbing i just wanted to experience myself i was trying to figure out how to prevent the next one i was going to fire prevention meetings for a while mm. after that You're like right to the source right yeah let's go how do we stop that from happening mm. and uh i read an, um, a, a 1970s a uh, forestry department study on how to reduce fire behavior effect on hills and they said you ought to plant agave and prickly pear cactus so i started going to these meetings and saying um if anyone has some defensible space i will plant agave 
in your defensible space. And people started to raise their hands. And I started, I met a farmer and we started growing plants. And I've got thousands, there's thousands of agave up there mm. in the Montecito Hills, all the way up to Buellton that have, that are in strips to protect against the next fire. But sure enough, there was a fire a couple years ago and one of our strips, it stopped the fire dead and all the buildings that were on the other side were protected. So it actually works. And then that got me the idea, once I started learning about agave, why don't I try to use some of these mature plants and make tequila out of them? There you go. So so I started tequila company. <laughs> and it was an accident. There, was, there were so many of these things in your life that have been like, this accidentally happened, and because of that accident, this yeah, good well, thing happened, or this tough yeah. thing happened, and this. Why don't we do something positive out of it? Do you, do you have a tequila business? I have now? a tequila company. Yeah, <laughs> yes. and it's, it's called Firebreak Tequila, which oh, is because of the fire. You know, it stops the Dang. Firebreak Tequila. That's so cool. It's weird how you can you can use judo and kind of yeah. you know get around the you know make something positive out of it. So there's a mountain just just in front of my house. It's it's like a hour walk from my my home. I climb it successfully, but when I reached the summit, it was only like four o'clock, and I, ha I had a bit of bad luck. It was, it was like beautiful weather, and it changed, and it was like cloudy again. Mm. I I could barely see my toes, like my legs, and my mother was there in, at the home. She's like my yeah. son who yeah. just survived an avalanche <laughs> and an earthquake. And she, she was there for like Six crying. of his team members died and now he's stuck on a mountain for two days. Yeah, right. Two months prior to that, he, he just had, she just lost, lost her, her husband. <laughs> so you were, yeah. that was, yeah. that was almost horrible. You're putting your mom through a lot. Yeah, then, yeah. After that, she never wanted me to climb? Yeah, I would say yeah. no, no. You're yeah. you're done yeah, climbing. Yeah, yeah. But but the good thing is that my mother lives still lives in the, in in the place, and we didn't have network there. Yeah. And I usually I'm in Kathmandu or climbing on the mountain. Oh, I so just, she doesn't uh, yeah, know you're climbing. Yeah, yeah. So I never tell her. So I just she, I just tell her like I'm going I'm going to this mountain and I'm going to be at the base camp, but just go climb, come back. You, so she just assumes that you're safe. Yeah.